Tonight's lecture is entitled, How Can a Good God Allow Evil? St. Rose of Lima and the Cross. You might say we have saved the best question for last, or, depending on how you want to look at it, the worst question for last. It's probably safest to say we've saved one of the biggest questions for last. If God is infinitely good, if he is all-powerful and knows everything, why do we find evil in the world? Atheists and agnostics often present this problem when asked why they do not believe in God. It is so common and so often present throughout history, this question, this problem, that it doesn't belong to any one thinker. The reasoning goes like this. If God is so good, why does the world he made seem so bad? Infinite goodness, the infinite goodness of God, does not seem to be able to coexist with evil. Therefore, God must not exist. But this is not just a question asked by atheists and agnostics. It's one of those inescapable questions asked by virtually everyone at a certain point. And it manifests that man cannot help but think deeply about the world. Why do we feel pain? Why do we suffer? How is it that people are able to commit evil actions, sins? The question only grows stronger when we ourselves or someone we know and love are faced with trouble and pain. Why am I suffering? Why am I suffering through this? How could I be wronged in this way? Is this an insurmountable obstacle to belief or an opportunity for receiving wisdom? And tonight, Brother Joachim will address this problem of evil in light of the, our Dominican sister, St. Rose of Lima. Uh, so St. Rose uh, was born on April 20th, 1586, in Lima, Peru. Uh, she was the 10th of 13 children uh, born to Gaspar and Oliva Flores. Uh, her three oldest siblings died at birth or soon afterwards. Um, and then she, so she was the 10th child. Um, and she was the first American saint. Uh, obviously, that's uh, all of the Americas, not just uh, the United States. Uh, so we're going to look at, at the problem of evil um, through her witness and example. Uh, but I just want to say to begin with that there's um, no simple answers to the problem of evil. Uh, no matter what answer we give, it's never going to be so satisfying that it makes evil um, or suffering easy to bear. Uh, there's always going to be an element of mystery to it. Um, the Catechism in, in paragraph 309 says that the whole faith uh, is needed to answer the problem of evil. And there's two um, important things to notice there. That it's the faith that, that by which we answer the problem of evil and that the whole faith is needed. Uh, so you can't just pick out one little tenet and go to town on it. Um, you have to, to see how the faith is interwoven, how all the different uh, tenets support each other. Um, so it, a lot of times when you'll encounter people um, who are trying to deny the faith by throwing the problem of evil at you, uh, especially people like the new atheists, uh, they begin by denying uh, philosophy uh, and the existence of the spiritual realm, and then they demand uh, a scientific or mathematical answer from you. Um, but we go, the only way we say anything about uh, the problem of evil is from the aspect of faith. Uh, so that's important to notice. To notice. Uh, that we're often, we're approaching the problem at a different level than, uh, than many of our uh, uh, interlocutors are. Okay, so the question tonight is, if, uh, is how can a good God allow evil? Uh, I want to begin by examining three important words in this question. Uh, God, good, and evil. Uh, so God is, um, he tells us in the Bible, in the Old Testament, God tells us his name is I am who I am. And Father Reginald Gergou Lagrange, a French Dominican who we've mentioned several times before, um, quotes St. Thomas Aquinas in saying that this name that God gives us uh, explains who he is. Um, we believe that God is not one kind or one form of being, uh, but being itself. Uh, he, is, it's, he is existence itself. Um, so we know uh, that things around us exist 
but none of them are perfect uh, in being. There's always, always some limitation. Uh, but God is, is the perfect being. He's, um, from Him, all, everything else takes its existence. Uh, the Catechism says that God is the boundless, shoreless ocean, as it were, of omnipotent, omniscient, spiritual substance. Um, so we attribute what we call attribute. We, we, attrib we give attributes to God. Um, so omnipotence, you know, he's all-powerful, um, omniscient, he is uh, all-knowing, um, and we give uh, many other attributes to him. Uh, goodness is one of those. Um, so the name I am who am signifies not only being, but the ever-present being, the all-powerful being. Um, there's no past or future uh, in God. Um, so that's, that's our first word that we're examining. The second is good. Uh, and goodness is one of God's attributes. Um, St. Thomas says that the essence of goodness, uh, what goodness is, is that it's in some way desirable. Uh, and a thing is desirable insofar as it's perfect. Uh, so just a little bit of an analogy, uh, let's just assume that everyone likes apples. Um, you would, uh, so just imagine uh, what a perfect apple would be like. You would say an apple is good insofar as it matches uh, your, your perfect idea of an apple. Um, so, you know, say you like red delicious, you know, a round, red, sweet apple um, would be your perfect idea of an apple. Um, and insofar as any apple you come in contact with doesn't match that, you would say that it's, it's not perfect or it's not good. Um, so God is good because he's the perfect being. He, he, he relies on no one or no, nothing else uh, for his existence, uh, for his action. Uh, there's no imperfection in God. Um, and so thirdly, we come to evil. Uh, and a lot of times people kind of tend to think of evil as something that exists in itself. Um, but it's not. It's a privation of the good. Uh, so evil is, no, is not anything that exists in itself. Um, if you remember from our second talk on St. Dominic uh, and the Catharists, uh, the Catharists believed in an evil principle uh, that was responsible for the material world. So they believed that evil um, was something that existed in itself. Uh, but we believe that it's, our, or we uh, go by the philosophy that evil is just a lacking of something uh, good. And God is the supreme good. Uh, evil is always said in, in reference ultimately uh, to God. If, if something leads us away from God, then it's evil. Um, but we also we speak of, uh, of physical things um, or physical actions as being evil insofar as they lack goodness. Uh, so like back to the apple example, if you have a wormy apple, uh, you would say it's, it's not good, it's not perfect. So you in some way could say that it's evil, um, but not, not morally evil. Um, so we have God as the, as the uh, perfect being. Um, and, it, and when somebody asks you the question, if, if God is all good, how can he allow evil? Um, it's important to note that uh, we speak of God's goodness in reference only to himself. Uh, so God is perfect and can still create something that's less than perfect than himself. Uh, we would still say that he's good. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to note here a counter-argument uh, to someone that would present the problem of evil to you, uh, uh, you know, somebody that's against the faith trying to disprove it. Um, an interesting argument call, comes from an early Christian philosopher, uh, St. Severinus Boethius. Uh, he said that if evil exists, then God must exist. Uh, he proposed this argument against, um, against someone who tried to disprove God because of the existence of evil. And he says that, uh, he goes by our definition that evil is a privation of good. Uh, and so if evil exists, then good would have to exist. Uh, because whatever there is a privation of, there must be something there that is a privation of. So if good exists, or if evil exists, then good exists. But good doesn't create itself. You know, the world around us uh, can't create itself. Something finite can't create itself. Uh, and so if there's a good order that exists, then there must be some cause of this good. And, and this is the cause that we call God, uh, the source of all goodness, the perfection of all goodness. Um, and so that's just a quick examination of the question itself. Um, and now we can say um, that 
since there can be a good and perfect God who's, who's perfect in himself, um, and he can still allow, or he can, he can create something that's less than perfect, um, we can ask, why would he allow um, evil in that? Uh, the answer, the best answer to that um, is that God only allows evil because he's powerful enough to draw a greater good out of it. Um, the Catechism, in paragraph 312, cites the story of Joseph, um, the son of Jacob. Uh, I guess, I'm sure you've all heard of Joseph and his coat of many colors. Uh, so Jacob had 12 sons, uh, and Joseph was his favorite, and his brothers were very jealous of him and ended up selling him uh, into slavery in Egypt. Uh, and it wound up, uh, Joseph worked his way into a position of power um, and uh, was responsible for the, the Egyptians um, building up stores of grain because he, he heard, he found in a, um, in a dream that the Pharaoh had, he interpreted a dream Say, to, to understand that there was going to be a famine in the land of Egypt. So they built up stores of grain, enough to last them through the famine. Uh, and when the famine came, uh, Joseph's brothers ended up in Egypt looking for food. Uh, and when they found out that Joseph had become, uh, come to this position of power there, afraid that he was going to take his revenge on them. Uh, but Joseph didn't do that. And he told them, you know, what you did to me, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, uh, that many people may be kept alive. Uh, so God, that's one instance that we see in the Old Testament of God um, working through secondary causes uh, to bring good out of evil. Um, the Catechism in paragraph 310 says that God in his wisdom created the world in a state of journey toward its perfection. Uh, you know, after all, if the world were as perfect as God, then it would be God itself. Um, you know, if it, was, if it was ultimate perfection, we would have to call the world God. Um, St. Thomas says that it belongs to the perfection of the universe to have inequality uh, so that every grade of goodness could be realized. Um, so we see inanimate matter as the lowest level of being, then we have plants, and then animals, uh, and then man, who is, who is um, a rational animal, as the highest form of, um, of physical life, uh, and then we have angels are great above us who are pure spirits. Um, and so this imperfection, this state of imperfection uh, that God created the world in uh, is what we would call physical evil. Um, so that's one kind of evil. Uh, it's not evil in its fullest sense. Um, but we see even in the physical order how God can draw good out of what we would call evil. Um, St. Thomas uses the example of a lion that kills its food. Um, you know, some people looking at that would say that you know, that's evil. Um, St. Thomas says that God allows it uh, in order to bring out the good of the animal being, of the lion being able to live. Uh, it kills its animals um, in order to live. Uh, a second example would just be that we're able to feel pain. Uh, for example, if you stick your hand in a fire, you're going to feel pain, but that's good because you're motivated to take it out uh, and not burn yourself. Um, so, um, so St. Thomas says that all of this is in keeping in God's providence for the universal nature. Uh, it says that everything fits together and works together, um, and as a whole, God's providence guides it, even though in, when it comes to individuals, we might look at something and say, well, that's evil. Uh, but St. Thomas shows that we should look at, at the big picture. Um, and secondly, we will come to moral evil, which is evil properly so-called. Uh, Blessed Pope John Paul II Fides Horatio says that uh, moral evil is the disordered exercise of human freedom. Um, so we know that uh, God, uh, as we spoke about, has these attributes, but we also say that God is intellect and will. And we know from Genesis that God chose to create us in his image and likeness. Um, and in order to do that, he, he gave us an intellect and he gave us a free will. Um, so that's um, it shows the dignity of man that God chose, us, chose to make us like himself. And freedom is, um, is how we are made uh, in God's image and likeness. Um, and so evil enters the world because man has used his freedom uh, to choose other than God. He's chosen to put, him, chose to put himself in the place of God. Um, and so... Um, we said that God was, was the supreme good, 
and we've talked many times in our lectures that man's final end is to be with God. Um, and so when man chooses something other than God, that's what we call evil, because he's choosing something that is not good for him. Um, the Catechism in paragraph 311 says that God created man to journey toward his ultimate destiny by his free choice and preferential love. Uh, so it's to man's dignity that he's able to choose. But God doesn't force anything on us, and so man is free to choose against his good, and that's what we call evil. Uh, so original sin is the rejection of our fundamental relationship with God, that is, of creature to creator. Uh, and so that shows that's the, <clears throat> the greatest sin that man can commit is the sin of pride, uh, the sin of refusing to acknowledge God as his creator. Uh, and so we see that man has rejected God, and what's God's answer to that? Well, it's not hatred, uh, it's the cross, it's love. Uh, that's God's answer to evil. Um, the Catechism calls it the mystery of our religion, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, as St. Paul says. Uh, the Jews were looking for a Messiah uh, who would be powerful and restore, uh, or would bring the Jewish nation to greatness. Um, so they sought, sought signs of someone powerful. But the cross um, is what would, so the cross appeared to them a stumbling block. You know, how could God uh, suffer crucifixion at the hands of, uh, of the Romans? Uh, and the Greeks would look for wisdom, they looked for human learning, uh, and so the, um, the idea of God suffering on the cross seemed foolish to them. Uh, but St. Paul says that the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Uh, we see this in the cross. And so we see, again, from the cross, uh, this is the greatest <laughs> evil in the world, the execution of God himself. Um, but out of it, God brought the greatest good, uh, that is our redemption. Um, and so God's response to evil is love, and so ours should be too. Uh, and we can look at the life of St. Rose to see, um, to see her response, to see how we should respond to the evil in our own lives, uh, to, to the suffering in our own lives. Um, in the Office of Readings today, uh, it's uh, from the writings of St. Rose, and she quotes Christ and says that grace follows tribulation. Uh, Without the cross, one can find no road to climb to heaven. Uh, it's when we are subject to tribulation and we turn to God, we return to that fundamental relationship with Him. Uh, and that's that we're dependent on Him for all that we have, for our existence itself. Uh, she says, uh, well, Christ Himself said, if you would be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Um, so that's, again returning to, to, to our fundamental relationship, that of creature to creator. Um, St. Rose continues in the Office of Readings, says that if only mortals would learn how great it is to possess divine grace, how beautiful, how noble, how precious, how many riches it hides within itself, how many joys and delights. So she, she is able to bear with evil uh, because she is so focused on the goodness of God's life in her, divine grace. Um, St. Paul says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Um, so, so God is never going to let us down if we turn to Him. He will give us His grace, His life that will help us through evil. Um, St. Paul says in Colossians, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, that is the church. Uh, so, um, people looking at this, passage might ask, well, didn't Christ um, suffer for everyone's sins when he died on the cross? Didn't he make atonement for all of them? Well, yes, he did. Uh, but that doesn't prevent us from joining our sufferings to his, um, and so winning uh, meriting graces that, we, that can be applied to ourselves or to other people. Um, so Christ himself um, died for everyone's sins, made atonement for everyone's sins, um, but there is still um, a way that we can marry. God has promised that if we um, persevere through our trials and our sufferings, that he will reward us with his grace. Uh, but that's not to say that Christ's suffering is insufficient in any way. It's just that we are, um, we are joining our sufferings to his. Uh, and St. Rose um, really practiced this, this, uh, this, this saying of St. Paul, uh, of, of joining her sufferings to Christ uh, for the sake of the church. Um, so as I mentioned, she was born in 1586 in Lima, Peru. Uh, she was originally named Isabel after her grandmother. 
Um, but after a, a sort of vision that her mother had of a rose um, above her cradle, uh, her mother changed her name to Rose. And as you might imagine, it didn't make her grandmother very happy. Um, so there was a lot of, of wrangling between the two women, um, really for most of Rose's childhood. Uh, and they really got quite, um, quite into it uh, many times in this uh, kind of pulled Rose in, in either direction, uh, caused a lot of suffering to her. Uh, but even, even from an early age, she was very given um, to penances, uh, and to, to offering up any sufferings that came her way um, in, to, in order to be united to Jesus. Uh, she took as her, as her patron, uh, St. Catherine of Siena. Her mother bought her a book um, when she was very young about St. Catherine. So that was always Rose's patron. Uh, we heard about St. Catherine of Siena last week when Brother Raymond talked about prayer. Um, so, uh, so, so Rose was... Um, was always known for her beauty. She was a very beautiful girl. She was very uh, vivacious uh, and also very gentle and charitable. But she always had a great zeal uh, and fearlessness in doing penance um, and in spreading her faith in whatever way she could. Um, it, there was, there's a story that when she was three, her mother decided to teach her to read and write. Now, her mother was a very pious woman, but also very demanding. Uh, she um, had a lot of big plans for her daughter. Uh, because of her, of her beauty and her talent, she was very talented in many ways, uh, she had hopes of marrying her off to uh, a rich young man. Uh, the family was very poor, um, so she had a lot of plans, so she decided to teach her daughter how to read at age three. Uh, and after a few attempts, she gave up in frustration, uh, yelled at Rose, and Rose um, went to her room and began to pray to Jesus, and a few minutes later, uh, returned to her mother, picked up a book, and began reading. Uh, she said she didn't receive any vision, but she, um, she prayed to God and uh, said she was able to read. Um, at the age of five, Rose took a vow of virginity in imitation of St. Catherine. And she kept this vow secret. Uh, she didn't want to tell her parents. Uh, she kept a secret for a long time until she was into her 20s. Um, and soon after this, uh, her brother made a comment about her beautiful hair. Uh, and she... she uh, realized how easy it was to fall into vanity. And so again, an imitation of St. Catherine, she cut her hair off. Uh, her mother punished her pretty severely for that. Um, but St. Rose was uh, always eager to keep her pride in check. Um, her mother enjoyed very much dressing her up and showing her off to her friends. Um, and they always paid Rose many compliments. Um, and one of, the, one of her mother's uh, favorite things was to, to make her crown of roses and set it on uh, Rose's head for, uh, for the fe big feast days that they went to. And Rose was always very embarrassed about this and tried to, um, to dissuade her mother from doing that, but her mother would have none of it. Uh, so to mortify herself, Rose had the practice of putting a pin in her crown of roses uh, to prick herself, to, to always call to mind that, uh, that she should not be taking um, vain pride in her hair uh, or in her beauty. Um, and that was, that was just one of many examples of mortifications that Rose practiced even from a, an early age. Uh, usually when her mother found out about it, uh, she would, would check these uh, sometimes extreme penances. Um, but Rose was, was very devoted to God, uh, and she was allowed to make the First Communion uh, at an earlier age than normal. Uh, she had a habit, even from her youngest years, of making daily visits to the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, she had a, a spiritual director at an earlier age than most people would. Um, she went to the Jesuits uh, first and had a Jesuit spiritual director for many years. Uh, but later on, she um, turned to the Dominicans. There's a Dominican church close by our house. So uh, in her early years, she had a Dominican uh, confessor and a Jesuit spiritual director. Um, Rose had, um, at an early age, uh, she uh, suffered paralysis um, and nearly died from it. Uh, she was at an age when she was uh, able to be confirmed and she was told that she would be receiving confirmation. Uh, she revived pretty quickly uh, and got over her illness. Um, she began practicing uh, daily communion um, around the age of 15. Uh, that was extremely rare in those days. Um, and so uh, Rose, as I said, was very beautiful. Her mother had a lot of 
plans for her to marry well. Um, and so there was always fighting between the two of them. Uh, Rose was, was obedient almost to the point of scrupulosity uh, to her mother, but she avoided parties and the social life uh, whenever she knew that her mother was going to be showing her off. Um, she, she turned to prayer and to penance. Um, she, had, she was known to have um, a bed of, she would put uh, logs, she made a bed of logs uh, in order to, to have some penance even while she slept. Um, and so there was uh, the Bishop of Lima <coughs> noticed her piety uh, and was very, very fond of her. And um, when Rose came of age, when she was in her teenage years, um, invited Rose to join the convent. He had just formed a community of poor clares in Lima. Uh, and Rose wanted to, but her parents refused. Uh, so she um, was obedient to her parents uh, for at least a time. Uh, she was talking to her, her Jesuit spiritual director, and he, he thought and uh, agreed with her. She was asking him. She said she thought she had a vocation to the convent. Uh, so her, her, her director agreed with her um, and told her to do it secretly because he knew that the parents would be very opposed. Uh, so Rose settled on a plan um, to join the convent, um, but right before she left, she made, stopped to make a visit uh, to the Dominican church that she had visited so often. Um, and she, at, as she was getting up from prayer, uh, or she tried to get up from prayer, um, but found herself unable to move. Um, and she couldn't move until she finally um, told the Blessed Mother that if she was able to get up, she would go home and be obedient to her parents. Uh, and immediately she, she got up and went home. Um, so, so Rose uh, was always, uh, except for this, this one instance, was always very obedient um, to her parents. Uh, she. Um, from a very early age, was very devoted to the poor. Um, she uh, grew um, herbs in her parents' garden and would make medicines out of them and distribute them to the poor. Uh, and as, as she got older, uh, she learned from St. Martin de Porres, who was um, a member of the Dominican uh, order at the church that St. Rose frequented. Uh, she learned from him how to treat different diseases, uh, how to doctor patients. Uh, so she began doing that. Um, not too long after um, her, her attempt to join the convent, um, she decided to join the Dominican Third Order. Um, and her mother allowed this because, um, as some of you know, you're in the Third Order yourselves. Um, the Third Order are laity. Um, they don't take uh, the vows of, of um, the priests and nuns, or the brothers and the nuns. Um, so her mother allowed her to do this. Um, and she joined the Brothers and Sisters of Penance of St. Dominic, so it was a very appropriate group for her to join. Um, when Rose joined this, she still um, had her vow of virginity, um, but her, her mother still didn't know at this point about this vow. Um, but Rose uh, joined this, this uh, third order um, and began increasing her penances. Um, she had, at, at various times, she had den attempted to wear chains around her waist, um, she made her bed even more uncomfortable by adding other things uh, to it besides the logs. Um, and she uh, tried a hair shirt once, um, but a couple, some of these penances were too much for her, so she, she had to give them up. Um, but she also suffered uh, from things even she didn't seek. Um, she, built, she had a, a hermitage built behind her parents' house, uh, and she lived in that. Um, because of the dampness, she contracted asthma and arthritis. Um, and so she suffered a lot from that. Um, and in everything, she joined her sufferings to Christ. Um, as St. Paul said in Romans chapter 5, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Um, so uh, Rose sought in every way to join her sufferings to Christ. Um, she always set out certain intentions um, for her sufferings. She prayed for the Archbishop, for her family and friends. Um, but it's, it's interesting enough, some people might you know, call her extreme penances, um, you know, say it's sadistic, um, but it wasn't this. Rose never undertook penance as an end in itself. Uh, it was always a means of growing closer to Christ. Um, so she always looked at Christ on the cross. Uh, she noted, noted how much God suffered for love of her uh, and so she sought to unite herself to him. 
So it was always undertaken um, with a view to growing in charity and to growing in love with Christ. Um, and so she, she lived her life. She never joined a convent and she never married, uh, even after fighting with her mother as uh, she did. She finally made her, her vow of virginity uh, known to her parents. And after they punished her, uh, they got over it. Uh, they allowed her to live as, uh, as a tertiary uh, in the little hermitage behind her house. So she spent her time doing good works. Um, she fed the poor, clothed the poor, uh, doctored the poor. Um, and then she, um, in, in 1617, uh, when she was 31 years old, uh, she contracted some unknown illness, uh, suffered terribly from it for about a week, uh, and then passed away. Um, so we see from the life of St. Rose um, that grace comes from suffering if we unite them to the cross. Um, and it's, it's uh, no, penances shouldn't really be, you know, extreme penances shouldn't be sought after um, without the advice of, of a spiritual director uh, or someone that knows your soul. You know, it's, most people aren't at the stage where they can uh, undertake great penances. Um, Rose was only able to because of her, her great desire for God. Uh, so she wasn't focused on the penances themselves. Um, she just sought God. Uh, so that, that wraps it up.